Good morning. Uh, no one likes to follow Eddie Chang up on the stage. Um, but actually, Eddie's uh, one of my biggest inspirations, and the work that you're seeing, I don't know if you saw that list of science and nature articles, not many people can get up and show that list. Um, and Jamie Henderson as well, who was here yesterday, this is two of the um, pioneers in brain-computer interfaces, which um, I've followed into, and we are really on the cusp of, of something um, profound. Um, we've taken a, a slightly different approach, but I want to just go back in time to this goofy photo. Uh, this was one of my first trips to the US. I was at uh, Wisconsin. I was about to enter into a neurology residency and I came to do a medical student elective. Um, and I was getting interested in the blood vessels. So if you see that squiggly, uh, uh, squiggly map of um, blood vessels, that's angiography. So this is the field of medicine which uh, goes up into the heart or the brain, mostly famous from the heart, stents in the heart and now the brain is becoming a rapidly um, progressing field, mostly in the domain of, of mechanics, so catheters, stents, balloons. And um, my idea early on was that you could use the blood vessels as an avenue up into the brain, and if you could figure out how to deliver electronics into that network, then you could use the infrastructure of the cath lab to then um, achieve, uh, achieve things that wouldn't otherwise be achievable. So I went back to Australia and I started my neurology residency and in the first month I, um, I looked after a patient, I was, I was an intern, and he was my age now, he's in his, in his 40s and he was a father of three and he ran a business and he had a stroke. And if you see that little, where the P is, that's the pons, that little grey area of tissue, was a, it's actually a very small stroke. The rest of the brain was fine, it was just damaged the outflow of the motor um, tract out of the brain. So, and, and he became locked in, he could move with his eyes. And I watched my uh, boss basically talk to him and his wife and he decided over the course of 72 hours that he didn't want to live like that and he was palliated. And I remember uh, thinking at the time that, you know, you have your brain that's working fine and if you have your inability to get all the messages out of your brain to control the muscles in your body, the muscles in your mouth, then you can't engage with the world. And so your motor system is this profoundly almost um, bottleneck uh, of your ability to engage with the world. Around that time, I read about uh, BrainGate. So you saw Jamie Henderson's work yesterday, and John Donahue's here, who was a father of that, and Lee Hochberg, who's now a mentor of mine. They published in Nature their first um, implant, uh, which was able to control a robotic limb. And for me, that was a, a profound, um, I saw that uh, technology as could, uh, the potential to be profoundly impactful in the field of neurology. So I, um, those two things combined, I started on a journey of trying to um, develop this technology. And over that journey, I've come to realize something quite simple, is that we have this dependency on our hands to engage in technology. So where do brain-computer interfaces go um, initially. And over the last 15 years, as the technologies emerged, we've become quite dependent on technology that is um, extremely powerful and which we conduct most of our lives on. Um, so it's, you can get a lot of work out of a keyboard and you can do a lot of things with a keyboard, but we've now moved into touch screens and obviously the iPhone changed the world and Vision Pro is now coming and Vision Pro and the meta technology still requires hand gestures. So you, we all depend on our ability of our hands to do things. And if you take that away, um, you know what it's like when you lose your phone or it dies and you're at a critical moment, how that feeling. So that feeling is associated with paralysis, uh, which is a big problem. And so how we think about this issue is that if the brain is working and any number of conditions that stop the ability of the message to come out of the brain are impaired, then the ability to control technology is impaired. So we've constrained the problem of the failed motor system around the failed motor system to control digital technologies. And so the concept is um, if we can restore the ability from the brain to directly connect to digital technologies, then you've restored the most critical things that you do with your phone. You probably don't think about what the most critical things are, but it's things like text messaging, emailing, banking, shopping, healthcare access. Um, Netflix, not so much, but patients want that, but um, that's not what Medicare is going to pay for in a device. 
So from that perspective, this is actually a huge problem. And brain-computer interfaces originally have been thought of, well, it's, it's for a tiny subset of the population, say ALS or locked-in syndrome. But the reality is there's a huge number of conditions that stop your ability to control technology. And it's not just paralysis. It's actually um, all the way down to the muscles and the joints, severe arthropathies, cerebral palsy, positive motor phenomenology as well. So we think every year there's 100 million people, new people, who are unable to use their phones ideally, and in that cohort there's 5 million people who are in the severe end of the spectrum who are in need of this type of technology right now. So you saw, um, you saw Eddie's work. So that 2006 paper I just mentioned, that's Lee Hochberg works and John Donahue in front of that. And then this year, there's been some incredible work coming out, um, which continues to be at the bleeding edge of, of uh, where this technology is. But still in 2023, we haven't seen a commercialized system. And so commercialization requires clinical, clinical translation. It requires a pivotal study. It requires FDA approval. And it requires a pathway to reimbursement so the patients can access the technology. And here are the things that are stopping commercialization. Um, I can't actually read what I've written here. So percutaneous. So Eddie, Eddie just mentioned the fully implantable problem. Patients don't want things sticking out. And that reminds me of the cardiac um, pacemaker devices in the 80s. They were originally coming out of the chest and connected to a big fridge-sized bit of equipment. Training. So um, training is fantastic, but for the patients to spend weeks to months training a system and then having to um, corrected in the morning is a challenge for commercial scale because it needs to work straight away. It needs to work out of the box. Um, troubleshooting. So a lot of the work right now in the academic field has a PhD or a postdoc in the room troubleshooting or the caregiver having to troubleshoot. So the system um, to be commercially, uh, to commercially scale can't be, can't be um, required through troubleshooting. Um, Recalibrating, I mentioned. So if the device, if you need to spend even five or 10 minutes to recalibrate the system to make it work, imagine opening your iPhone and having to spend 15 or 20 minutes recalibrating it before it would work. It it's becomes a, a hard to use it on a minute-by-minute on minute basis. Material degradation has been a, a big issue in the field. So even with the very high channel count systems, the material in the tissue living for a lifetime over time begins to degrade. And it's been one of the big issues. In particular, polymer-backed substrates don't have a good track record of sustaining longevity in the human body. A lot of the systems that are being assessed now have polymer backings. And there's a question over, are they going to last, as well as some of the metals? And then tissue rejection, which is um, glyotic inflammation, continues to be an issue, which results in um, impedance changes, which can result the capacity for high fidelity sensing. So to solve all these, um, to solve all these problems means that you need a, a simple solution. And we've been focused on a more simple solution. And um, part of that is that, by nature, it has to be more simple for us, because we're utilizing um, an avenue into the brain that doesn't accommodate as much room and as much space. And so the concept is that we can access the blood vessels and deliver electronics into the walls of the blood vessels, like a tattoo, where the blood can still flow and it can engage with the brain surrounding it and then have cables coming out of the brain where there's no need for um, craniotomy or open brain surgery, but you can't obstruct the blood flow. And probably um, one of the biggest um, breakthroughs that we had was not to go on the arterial side, where if it blocks, it causes stroke, but on the venous side, where there's same thing happened in cardiac pacing in the 1980s. There was a concern over, well, can you leave a blood vessel in the heart that does pacing? And it might block, it might cause thrombosis. And you know, we figured out what materials worked, aspirin dosing worked, how you put it in, what radial forces were needed. So in a sense, we're sitting on the shoulders of all the work that's happened over the past number of decades in the cardiac space and now bringing that up into the brain. So I came to uh, New York in 2015 to learn how to do these procedures. Um, I'm still faculty at Mount Sinai in New York. I'm doing this less and less, but my clinical career gave me a really good understanding of what the, where the field was moving, and it's become one of the fastest growing areas of med tech, neurovascular. Um, we now are at the precipice of, we have um, about 120 patent applications, about 40 granted patents around bringing electronics, sensing and stimulating into the blood vessels into the brain. And all this was built on the concept of a stent. Oh, sorry, I'm seeing different things down here. I'm not sure what was behind me all that time. Did you see this already? No, no okay. 
Did you say this one? OK, so this is a stent. Um, this is the, uh, the kind of concept. Is probably most of you know what a stent is. It opens up in a blood vessel. It pushes on the wall. Now, this is treating a plaque. Um, and that's what a stent was built for, to mechanically hold open and scaffold open a blood vessel. Um, we don't want to do that. We're only going in blood vessels that are healthy, but we're using the scaffold to push the electronics into the wall so the blood flows. But this is the core concept of the technology. And so this is just a little animation. So we put sensors onto the stent. We connect that to a lead. We've targeted the area of the brain through a blood vessel that we want to have. And then the cable comes out through the venous passage down and out through the neck and the jugular vein. And then we put the electronics down in the chest. Um, so we've started with a large blood vessel with some access to the motor cortex. You can see that blue area, the motor cortex comes down around the side of the brain. We're only in a small area because we're starting in the safest area with a channel count that is um, scalable. Um, and so that gives us a constraint over how much information we can get out of the brain. And the question became, how much can we do with that? You saw Eddie Chang showing the brainwave data. So we're doing something similar. but when nothing nearly as sophisticated as what Eddie Chang is doing. So we are trying to derive signals that are very robust, that work immediately, that don't require training. We are doing robust analysis of various types of um, very obvious uh, you know, motor activities that we all know how to do, that we don't need training, that are quite simple and robust. And then we convert those into outputs that generate key presses or switches into a, into a de device control. So we've gone from motor intent, we decode versions of motor intent, we bring it out of the brain wirelessly, and we're, um, we were working with Microsoft, and we're now primarily working with Apple products. So the study that we're working towards is going to be um, with iOS control. We're going to have our own app with an iOS, but then there's going to be generalized iOS control, and Apple's um, helping us uh, get through some of the kinks. And so one of the critical things, so I mentioned you know, clinical translatability. Um, the field is now moving from the engineering domain into the clinical science domain, and we're having conversations right now with the FDA over what is a clinically meaningful, efficacious outcome metric for BCI. It hasn't existed yet. So we're in that dangerous position of having that um, first negotiation with FDA over what success should look like in a very new field of medicine, and we have to get it right in a way that not only suits the needs of FDA, but also Medicare and CMS. So we're trying to bake into a clinical trial outcomes that are meaningful. And we're using this um, concept of this digital motor output, which is a quantified, measurable unit of function of the system um, in simple measures of accuracy and latency that basically mean you can make a selection on a screen of the thing that you want to select. And then we'll build a whole ecosystem around that. So this is the system, a stent attached to a lead connected to electronics. We have an intermediary um, device that has um, that has uh, connectivity, uh, which then creates a, a server which can connect to local devices. So we've now up to 10 patients. Our 10th patient was just enrolled in our feasibility study a couple of, uh, a couple of weeks ago. He just actually activated last week. Um, and we are taking those, the data from those. We're now stopping um, before we now go back to the FDA to get ready for our pivotal study, or phase three study, which hopefully will be uh, that required for, a, for the first uh, market approval of an implantable brain-computer interface. Um, so I just want to show this. So this is a gentleman who lives in uh, New York, where we're based. Um, he was implanted at Mount Sinai by Dr. Majidi. And this gentleman is completely locked in. He normally depends on caregivers to um, interpret his needs. And this was, a, this was in the very first session, um, utilizing one of the first click outputs into a switch um, iOS control of, the app, of an Apple. And he's doing a health report. I just want you to watch the end um, of this, the smile of this gentleman when he completes this task. And this was a really big moment for us. Um, and it's a very simple, robust, but um, simple way of controlling the IO, uh, Apple phone. So we're developing different mechanisms of using these um, simple but low output key, um, key presses to make selections and make their way around screens. We're having some issues where some of the patients are getting caught in loops in the Apple system because it's not quite at the level of moving a cursor around a screen, but um, Apple has built-in mechanisms that we're leveraging that make this 
uh, make this possible. You see him smile here at the end. This was a really incredible moment. He doesn't. He's only got a small amount of movement left in his face, but it's um, hard to imagine how, what it must be like to lose all of your agency and capability, autonomy, and then you just get a little bit of it back. Just the ability that he can do that on his own and everyone can leave the room is a very powerful uh, moment of, of restore, restoring. I think I'm running out of time here. So this is a different example. So the system is um, generalizable. In this case, it's being combined with eye tracking. Um, we think uh, our system solves the biggest pain point with eye tracking, which is the ability to click. Oh, I'm, I'm out of time. Merging it with LLMs, um, generalizability, uh, phase three coming. Um. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.